It will be, well, introduction, first, first part, yeah, to optical infrared interferometry. And, uh, well, you may get access yeah, to a video of this lecture, uh, something similar, which has been uh, shot in English under that link. And all the slides will become accessible yeah, via internet. Yeah? So I send you another email yeah, with, a, with a link, so you... So you, you don't even need to take notes, yeah? So here is just a small summary, yeah, of what the lecture, well, the four or five lectures coming, yeah, will be about, yeah? So it's a kind of summary, yeah? So let, let's just assume that you want to observe a distant object with a telescope, yeah? So you have the primary mirror with the diameter D1. Then you have the, the detector in the focal plane. And if the object you are looking at is a star, yeah, what you see yeah, is very disappointing. Yeah? Because you see a dot of light, a dot of light. So you see a very bright central dot surrounded by yeah, the first uh, dark ring, then a second ring of light. Yeah? And this is known as the Ponspet function yeah, of the telescope. It is nothing to do with a star. Yeah? It's because the star is unresolved. Yeah? So it's just a point of light and there is nothing you may learn about the star, whether it is young or old, massive or light, red or blue, nothing. The only information you get yeah, is that the width yeah, of the central spot yeah, is 2.44 times the wavelength divided by the diameter of the mirror. Okay? And this gives you an angle in region, okay? if you want to convert it. Yeah? In degrees, where well, you need to multiply by, by something. Okay, now if you, if you take yeah, uh, a telescope a bit larger with a diameter d2, yeah, you see it's bigger. Well, what you get yeah, is the same image, yeah, with, but with a central dot, yeah, much narrower, yeah, well, inversely proportional to the diameter of the telescope. Yeah. Now, well, I if you if the star is really point like yeah, you, you will still be disappointed, yeah? Now, if you would look, yeah, at an extended object like a very distant exoplanet, yeah, that you could, uh, well, barely resolve, of course, there is a difference between using the first and the second telescope because given the fact that the central dot here is narrower, yeah, you get more detailed information about an extended object, yeah? So larger is the diameter of the telescope, the best it is, of course, yeah? Well, in addition, you know that the energy collected by the mirror yeah, is proportional to the square of the diameter. Yeah? So this is another advantage, of course. You may see much fainter object. Okay, so let's assume that we are looking yeah, at a distant object. Well, for instance, we are on a nearby star and we are looking at our own Earth. Yeah? So this is how the, the Earth yeah, could look like if you use a too small telescope. Now, if you use it a bit bigger, well, you get more detailed information, of course, yeah. And uh, you see that, well, there is a need for very large telescopes, and there is a theory, yeah, in, uh, well, all over the continents, yeah, to build ever larger, larger telescopes, yeah, to get fainter and fainter, but also more, more details. So you probably heard about the project, European project of the European Extremely Large Telescope, yeah, known as the EELT, in principle 43 meters in diameter. Then you have the US project known as TMT, 30 meter <coughs> telescope, yeah. So it's a mirror of 30 meters in that case, yeah. Well, the first one will be located here yeah, in principle in, uh, well, very no north of Chile, yeah, very near to Paraná. It's called uh, Cerro Ama Amazones. And the TMT, 30 meter telescope, in principle should be built yeah, in Hawaii. Yeah? But the Hawaiian people are very much against it yeah? because they say, well, it's a kind of a threat for the, their god yeah? who, who is, uh, let's say, a blessed on top of the Mauna Kea volcano. Yeah? And so there's, there's a real life problem. We don't know yet where it will be located finally. Then there is still the G GMT uh, telescope, which is a giant Magellanic telescope. Uh, this one will be in uh, 
well, very near to Las Campanas in Chile also. And so you see, well, very big telescopes. Now, is it possible yet yeah, to build a telescope larger than, let's say, 43 meters? Well, probably it would be very, very difficult because of, of the structure yeah, to hold the mirror with the present day technologies, of course. Yeah? But, but already, you see, in 1868, well, two French astronomers, Fizeau and Stéphane, yeah, thought, well, they said, well, in terms of angular resolution, two small apertures, distant of B, so B is a baseline, is the distance between the two small telescopes, yeah, are equivalent to a single large aperture of diameter B. Yeah? This is fabulous. Yeah? What you need yeah, is to recombine the light beams coming from two separate telescopes. Well, in principle, you do that in monochromatic light, but well, there is some possibility to enlarge the spectral band. And then, well, it would be fantastic yeah, to have a baseline, for instance, of 100 meters. Yeah? And already now, yeah, at the VLTI yeah, at ISO, Chile, they are well very currently uh, making observation with a, what is known as an interferometer. Yeah? So they have sub-apertures with a very long baseline. Yeah? And in the US, there is a Shara facility on top of Mount Wilson in California, where they have only uh, where the size of the telescope of the mirrors is just one meters, but they get to baselines up to 220 20 meters. Yeah? And so they are able yeah, to image stars with an angular resolution that would be equivalent to a single dish mirror having a diameter of 220 meters. Yeah? So it's a very nice technique. Yeah? And well, I will, of course, yeah, explain to you yeah, how, why it's possible and what are the characteristics yeah, of... Okay, now, what you will observe yeah, in the focal plane, as you will see in a moment, yeah, maybe we can close the door, yeah, yeah. What you will observe in the focal plane yeah, is, uh, first of all, yeah, where is the point spread function? Well, so this is a central dot yeah, of a single dish with fringes, you see, fringes of light, yeah, bright and dark. And in fact, the interfringe angle yeah, is of the order of lambda to B. Yeah? So before we saw for a single aperture, it was 2.44 yeah, lambda over D, where D was the diameter of a single aperture. And here the interfringe yeah, measures lambda over B. And this will allow you to recover details yeah, with such a small angular resolution. Yeah? So it's fabulous, it's very nice. Okay, so in summary, single dish yeah, gives you a blurred image of an extended object. If you increase it, yeah, and here I assume yeah, that I'm observing yeah, in uh, the absence of an atmosphere around the Earth. Yeah? So this is from space, yeah, okay? Because well, the atmosphere will deteriorate, of course, the image quality. This is with a slightly bigger telescope. And now, whoa, if you could use an interferometer, yeah, in principle, well, you could yeah, uh, reveal an image yeah, with a resolution that is just limited yeah, by the length of the baseline you will be using. Okay, now, uh, <coughs> in practice, yeah, and we will see that during the, the course, what you see is a convolution product yeah, of the point spread function of the telescope, so the image of a point-like object by the real image that you would see if your telescope were perfect. So as you increase um, the width of the point spread function, yeah, well, you get a better image. So convolution uh, product, yeah, so we will see that later, yeah, is just a double uh, product of convolution. And we will see, yeah, during the the next lecture is that, in principle, it's possible to recover yeah, that image yeah, by uh, inverse or convolution or what you call a deconvolution. Yeah? So there, is, there are many things that you can do. Yeah. Okay, this is another theorem that we will see. I'm not going into the details now. So okay, uh, first a small introduction. Now just a few reminders. Yeah? 
about uh, electromagnetic waves. So, well, what astronomers are interested in yeah, is uh, like looking at the filament, a yeah, very small filament of a light bulb, yeah, which is very, very tiny, yeah, and uh, they would like to resolve it. Okay, now, if you'd like to measure the weights, yeah, what you would do, well, you need to measure the angle under which you see the filament, and you multiply it by the distance, yeah? Because, indeed, the tangent of this angle is the opposite side, so the linear width, yeah, divided by the distance, yeah? Okay, so astronomers do the same with the stars. So here you have a star, which diameter, yeah, is two, tie, two times the radius, linear radius. Now, z is the distance to the observer, now the angular diameter, big delta, yeah, is of course twice the angular radius. Angular radius given by the ratio between the linear radius of the star to the distance. Yeah? So if you take the tangent yeah, of rho, you have exactly that now because the angle is so small, you may take the angle in radian yeah, and write the, that relation. Yeah? Now, wh wh why is it uh, very important yeah, and interesting is the following. So if I take a star, with the radius r, do you agree that the luminosity, which is a quantity yeah, of light emitted yeah, by the star, is just well the surface of the star, so 4 pi times r squared, multiplied yeah, by the flux, yeah, so the quantity emitted per surface unit, yeah, flux that I will represent like that, yeah, pi times f. So this is the flux yeah, measured at the stellar surface. Yeah. Now I know that this, is, this, this must also be equal yeah, to 4 pi times z square, where z yeah, is the distance between the observer and the star. Now you, you may think of an extremely large sphere. And of course, the flux that we would measure on Earth would be a small pi f, yeah, because it is the apparent flux. Yeah. Now, what is the relation between uh, the absolute flux at the star and the flux on Earth, well, it's easy. We find that the flux on the star is equal to the flux on Earth, yeah, times z over r squared, which is the apparent flux divided, yeah, by the square of the angular radius. Now what we know, yeah, is that under the assumption that the star emits like a black body, yeah, like a black body. Well, the total flux emitted yeah, by black body is given by the Stefan Boltzmann law, yeah, which is equal to sigma, the constant of Stefan Boltzmann, times the power four of the temperature. Yeah. And uh, well, if it's not perfectly black body, you, you would call this the effective temperature. If it is a black body, yeah, well, it's absolute temperature. Now, from this relation, yeah, last relation, we see that we may extract yeah, the effective temperature of the star, which would be equal yeah, to the apparent flux measured on Earth divided by the square of the angular radius divided by sigma at the power, at the power 0 0.25. Yeah? And so uh, we see, we see what we see. Uh, we see that by just measuring yeah, the flux of a star here on Earth, and by measuring its angular radius, yeah, you may determine very accurately yeah, what is the temperature of the star. Yeah? So you could do this for the sun. Yeah? So for the sun, yeah, when you measure the flux on Earth, now you divide by the angular radius. So the angular radius, yeah, you know that the angular diameter is about half a degree, yeah? So the angular radius is a quarter of a degree, so it's about 15 arc minutes. But you have to transfer, the, well, to translate that into radians, in radians. And now, and then from that you get the temperature, yeah? So it's very nice, yeah? Now, if, if you know the angular radius of a star, well, we've seen that the linear radius, yeah? is equal to the angular radius times the distance of the star, 
Yeah? So then you get a direct access yeah, to the linear diameter or linear edges of the star. So you see the importance yeah, of uh, being able to accurately measure angular radii or diameters. Okay, just a few reminders. Yeah? So what uh, <coughs> I have represented here is an electromagnetic wave yeah, propagating yeah, well, in the plane of the screen. Well, it is monochromatic and uh, it's polarized yeah, because it's oscillating just in that screen. And uh, just think of the wave yeah, uh, well, at a particular location, Z. Yeah, so I fix the apsis of Z. Yeah, and uh, I just measure as a function of time yeah, the variation of the electric, electric, electric field. Yeah? So what I see, it's an oscillation represented by this expression, yeah? this is a cosine. So it's a real amplitude, A, times the cosine function. And then you have seen to show the time variation of the electron, electric field, yeah? I just add nu times t, where t is the time, nu is the frequency, yeah? So we see that whenever uh, nu uh, t is equal to one over nu, yeah? Well, I just pass, yeah, from one, one, one top to, 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 to the other one, yeah? And so the, <coughs> the period yeah, of the wave yeah, is just one over nu, one over the frequency. Yeah? So this gives you the time dependence. Now, if you would do the, the opposite, you would say, okay, I free the time t, yeah? and I just see along the z axis uh, how the electromagnetic field yeah, is varying. Yeah? Well, of course, I would see something, so I freeze uh, the time, yeah? and I, I look as a function of z, then what I would see is that, well, it's also a cosine dependence, but here I have z divided by lambda because the separation between the two crests yeah, would be lambda, the wavelengths yeah, of, of the light. And the relation between uh, the frequency and the wavelengths yeah, is just c, a lambda equal c times t. So during a period, yeah, uh, the light yeah, has traveled yeah, one wavelength, of course, but T is one over nu, so we have that relation. Now, it's very useful yeah, and practical to express the electromagnetic, well, the electric field yeah, uh, in complex notation. Yeah? So, if you want to render this complex, what we do, we, we just say, okay, well, the electric field is equal to A times the real part yeah, of imaginary exponential 2 pi multiplied by nu t minus z over lambda, like this, yeah? Oops, uh, too fast, here, yeah? So you just say, okay, the electric field, yeah, is a real part yeah, of that number. Now, wh why we do that, yeah? It's because we know that this Imaginary exponential, yeah, may be decomposed into two products. One only time being time dependent, the other one being uh, distance dependent, yeah. So it's what we do. You we find this factor coming from that, and that one comes here. So it's a very nice separation. And now uh, what we, we may continue. We, we may say, okay, uh, uh, in practice, what we will do, we will make interference between the uh, different uh, light beams. So we, we will essentially make addition yeah, of uh, electric fields. So let's adopt yeah, the complex representation given here. And well, let's still uh, make it uh, more compact. Let's call this the, the complex amplitude yeah, of the electric field. Yeah? So in, at the end, yeah, well, the electric field yeah, becomes A, where A is a complex amplitude time, this time dependence, yeah? Now the, the problem, yeah, at the optical wavelengths, yeah, is that it is impossible to measure, yeah, variation of the electric field as a function of time. Hello, no, no use of an iPhone, otherwise I confiscate, yeah, 
Yeah. And next time you have to pay a, a beer to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Double penalty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, otherwise you are distracted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, as I say, yeah, it's impossible yeah, to measure yeah, as a function of time yeah, the electric field yeah, at optical wavelengths because where the associated frequency is much too, too high. Yeah? So for instance, for visible light, wavelengths of 5,000 angstrom, yeah? the frequency you see is six times 10 to the 14 Hertz. Yeah? So it's varying so rapidly that it's impossible to measure. If you restrict to radio wavelengths, yeah? the frequency is much lower. And there it is possible yeah? to measure in real time yeah? variation of amplitude. Yeah? So for an engineer, yeah, if you find out yeah, how to make a device yeah, to measure the electric field at optical wavelengths, yeah, you will become a milliardaire, yeah? so a very rich man. <laughs> yeah. So just think about it. OK. Yeah. Since we cannot measure yeah, at optical wavelengths the electric field, what we can measure is the intensity. Yeah? So, via, you know, the uh, pointing vector, yeah, we know that this is just given yeah, by the average yeah, of the square of the electric field. Yeah? So let's evaluate how much it is, where the real, uh, uh, the, the amplitude, yeah, the complex amplitude, big A, is real. Yeah? So let's assume that the electric field is re represented by A times the exponential of ATP nu t. And well, let's just make it full, completely real. So it will be A times plus 2 pi nu t. Let's evaluate here how much is the average of E square. So we should be proportional to the intensity. Yeah? So it's something like, well, I integrate from minus the period up to one period of this quantity, so it will be a square here, time cos square of two pi nu t dt. And I divide this by two t since I take an average value. Yeah. Now I know the relation yeah, that uh, cos of two x equal to 2 cos square x minus 1, which means that cos square x is equal to 1 plus cos sine of 2x by 2. Just replace it here, so it will be equal to a square times this integration of 1 plus cos sine of 4 pi nu t dt over, over how much? 40? Yeah. Okay, so I find that it would be a square. First I integrate, yeah, 1 from 1 minus 1 t minus t to t. So it would be 2t divided by 40. It would be a square divided by 2 plus a square times the integration of from minus t to plus t and the cosine of 4 pi nu t dt over 4t. Yeah? Now, well, I could calculate this, yeah? But you see, <coughs> this quantity yeah, is varying very rapidly. Yeah? And since I integrate from minus t to plus t, yeah, it means yeah, that you will have a once maximum minimum, once positive, once negative, still once positive and once negative, and you are adding just zero with zero and zero. So this will be identically equal to zero, and we find that the intensity yeah, is equal to a square divided by two. And now, just by convention, yeah, well, in astrophysics at least, yeah, the intensity is defined as the product of the complex amplitude by its complex conjugate, yeah, 
which is the square of the module yeah, of the complex amplitude, which is also equal to the square of the real ampli amplitude. Okay? So this is just a definition. Yeah? Uh, people have dropped the factor two. Okay, now, <coughs> just a few reminders about the Huygens Fresnel principle, yeah? So according to Huygens, yeah, a wavefront, yeah, may be a sort of being composed, yeah, of an infinity, yeah, of smaller sources of uh, wavelets, okay? And if you'd like to know, yeah, the evolution of the front wave as a function of time, you would just let during an interval of time, delta t, where the spherical waves yeah, from each point yeah, evolve. And then you would take the envelope, yeah, and you see if you, if you would have taken yeah, a sufficiently large number of uh, discrete source on the plane wave, what you would find is that, whoa, the evolution gives rise still yeah, to a wave plane yeah, a bit farther away. Well, here is a case of a spherical wave. You do the same game. Huh? You consider an infinity of... a uh, secondary sources emitting concentric waves, wavelets. And after a certain time interval, you take uh, the envelope and you still see, whoa, it's a spherical wave. So again, yeah, thought that the light was propagating as waves, yeah, because well, you just uh, realized that <clears throat> during these experiments, yeah, uh, this enabled him to understand uh, a lot of uh, geometrical effects. But Fresnel had it Another principle, he said, wow, let's assume yeah, that two spherical wavelets yeah, uh, just overlap yeah, at a given point and that they are oscillating in phase. Yeah? So he said, what you should do, you should just add them positively. Yeah? So there will be a positive interference. Now, if two wavelets yeah, are just oscillating in phase opposition, in that case, they will annihilate yeah, and you will observe a minimum. And this is exactly the theory that enables to understand the formation of the airy disk, yeah? so the point spread function in the focal plane of a telescope is because of diffraction, yeah? according to this principle. And of course, I mean, uh, <clears throat> during the course, yeah, we will demonstrate yeah, uh, what characterizes exactly yeah, the airy disk as a function. Yeah? So this is just a reminder that the angular diameter of the airy disk yeah, from the center of the lens yeah, is uh, just limited yeah, by this quantity, 2.44 lambda over d. Yeah? So something uh, related yeah, to the mirror and not to the stars that you're observing. Yeah? OK, now, what I've said until now yeah, is valid yeah, if you are out of the atmosphere. Yeah? There is no uh, Earth's atmosphere. In, in the presence of the atmosphere, situation yeah, is uh, awful, yeah, especially in Liège. Yeah? Because well, you, you, you may think of the atmosphere yeah, as being composed yeah, of individual cells, you see them here, with a constant refractive index and temperature. Yeah? But these cells are very small, yeah, extremely small. Well, in Yesh, typically, they measure one, two centimeters, three centimeters, yeah? If you go to Hawaii or in Chile, well, they get up to 30 centimeters large, yeah? And so, well, this makes a big difference, yeah? Because we've seen that the angular resolution of a telescope, yeah, was something like 122 lambda over d. Now, if the cell, atmospheric cells, yeah, have a diameter, average diameter, average size, comparable to that of your telescope, yeah, it's okay. You will see an airy disk. Yeah? And th this is very nice with a small telescope yeah, like a Galileo scope. Yeah? I'll tell you more about that. Yeah? Uh, you may observe a star, and you will see the airy disk. Yeah? Because the diameter of that telescope is 5 centimeters. Yeah? So comparable, I would say, to the size of the atmospheric cells in Liège. Uh, <clears throat> now, if your, if your diameter, the diameter of your mirror, yeah, is much larger, yeah, well, then it means that you may think of a, as if you have many atmospheric cells 
individual and independent yeah, were passing over your telescope. And one thing I forgot to say yeah, is that the lifetime yeah, of a single cell, atmospheric cell, yeah, is probably in the edge of the order of one millisecond. Yeah? So 1,000 of a second. Well, in the very good sites like uh, Chile, Hawaii, the lifetime may go up to five milliseconds. Yeah? And this is great. So what, what will you see yeah, in uh, the focal plane of your telescope? Well, in that case, you will see uh, from each atmospheric cell an individual image as if the diameter of the mirror yeah, was the diameter of the cell. And all those images would be incoherent and would overlap on top of each other. And, uh, well, it would uh, really um, affect the image quality. Now, so somebody, I mean, uh, it was Labéry, Antoine Labéry, who was, a, well, director of Haute Provence Observatory, I think already in 1976, yeah? Thought, well, if you make that observation in monochromatic light, yeah? Well, it could be that, you know, some of the light, yeah? Uh, passing through one cell and some of the light passing through another cell yeah, could still interfere in the focal plane, yeah, following a Huygen Huygen Fresnel principle, and could give rise maybe to what is known as speckles, yeah, speckles, light speckles, which diameter yeah would be well of the order of one one twenty two lambda over d, where d is really the diameter of the mirror, yeah, but to get those observations since the lifetime yeah, of the atmospheric cells is of the order of one millisecond, you would need to take uh, 1,000 images yeah, per second to get those images clearly. Yeah? And then after, well, you could make a signal analysis and uh, you could retrieve interesting information on uh, your objects. But, well, this is something else. I will not talk more about uh, uh, <coughs> speckle interferometry, but well, it's just nice to know that it exists. So you see, this is a big problem. In the atmosphere, you have uh, cells which deteriorate image quality. And well, and nowadays, yeah, for the very big telescope, very, well, eight meter telescope that exists, yeah, and the future ones, yeah, people have thought about uh, adaptive optics yeah, to correct for this effect. Yeah? But well, adaptive optics, yeah, I'll talk, uh, a little bit later, was first invented by militaries, yeah, because they were they wanted to get the clear images of uh, spy satellites, yeah, passing over the U.S. and so they redeveloped that technique. And uh, well, some 15 years later, yeah, the astronomers got to know about it, and uh, they are using it for uh, more peaceful, yeah, objectives, because it's just sky observations. Okay, now, uh, okay, this is an image yeah, of speckles, yeah? So this is short exposure, probably five milliseconds, and you see you know, some speckles. And if, if the star you would be looking at yeah, would be binary, yeah? What you would see here, just uh, binary speckles, yeah? So if the star is single, you, you don't see it, yeah? Now, this is a long exposure. And you see that everything is blurred yeah? because you're in one, even one second, yeah? you get uh, almost 1,000 images yeah? superposing to each other and it, uh, it deteriorate, de deteriorates the images. Yeah. So after the interruption, yeah, because uh, unless some, do some of you have a flashlight with you here or not? You have iPhones, do you have a nice light source? on them or not? You do, yeah. So we will make an experiment later, yeah, uh, which is the following. We will give you, yeah, aluminum paper, needles, yeah, so not to attack your neighbor, yeah, but to make a hole, yeah, in a aluminum fold, and the hole, yeah, should be as small as possible, yeah. I would say half a millimeter, and try to make it circular. So if you take the, the needle and you do like that, yeah, after you look yeah, with, a, with a magnifier, you will see that it's something horrible. Yeah? Well, well, the holes can be something like that. Yeah? So 
you really need to take the needle perpendicular yeah, to the fold, well, to the aluminum paper, try to get something like that. Yeah. And then after, we would, we would use a, a light source yeah, from one of your iPhones. Well, this is the best use you can make of them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we would look at them, yeah? We would look at them, yeah? The light source, yeah? And you will see, yeah, the airy disk. You will see the pond spread function, which is 122 lambda over D, where D, yeah, is about one millimeter, where lambda, yeah, uh, would be the wavelengths of visible light, 5,500 angstrom. Well, then you convert that in region, yeah? So you need uh, to adopt the same units, yeah? Up and down. After you translate in seconds of arc, yeah? And for one millimeter, I think you would find that it's about two arc minutes. The angular resolution is about two arc minutes, yeah? And because, well, the angular resolution of our eye yeah, is of that order, you'll be able to see, uh, I mean, uh, the airy pattern, yeah? yeah? And so, well, during uh, the experiment, after I will pass, look at your model, and if, you, if it's bad, yeah, you get a bad point. If it's good, you get a good point, yeah? Easy. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about um, the history of stellar diameter measurements, yeah, since I told you this is a very important issue, yeah? Well, until uh, Galileo, yeah? Well, most of scientists, yeah, astronomers, thought that the angular diameter of the stars, yeah, was about two arc minutes. Do you know why? Two arc minutes. Yeah, related to our eyes. Because, well, usually, yeah, well, the diameter of our pupil, yeah, can be, well, during daytime, well, probably, uh, well, one millimeter, yeah? One millimeter. And so, uh, if it is one millimeter, it means that your resulting power, the angular resolution of your eye, is about two arc minutes. And so, well, okay, people saw that the angular diameter yeah, of the star was about two arc minutes. Galileo, yeah, proceeded um, in a different way, yeah. He just uh, used, yeah, a very uh, thin wire, looked at a star like Vega, yeah. And, of course, if he would set his eye yeah, too close to the wire, he would not see the star. You agree? If he would set it a little bit farther away, not yet, not yet, and then he went up to the distance when he would see the star appearing, yeah? And then he would say, well, the angular diameter of Vega is uh, the angular diameter under which I see the wire, yeah? So he would divide, yeah? Well, the thickness of the wire by the distance, he would get the angular diameter of the wire, and he would state, well, this is the angular diameter of the star, Vega. Now, he found, uh, yeah, that well, the angular diameter he reported yeah, was about five seconds of arc. Five seconds of arc. Why? Why do you think five seconds of arc? <laughs> so I already gave you the answer during uh, the beginning of my lecture. Yeah? Yeah. So is Galileo above or under the atmosphere? Under. He's under the atmosphere, yeah? And so, well, it's subject also to the fact that, you know, in front of the star, there are some atmospheric cells passing, you know, with a very small size, yeah? And, uh, well, well the, the observations were carried out in Padova, and uh, probably the size of the cells, yeah, were about uh, something like five centimeters, yeah? And so, well, you found five seconds of arc, yeah? Okay. So, but this is already an improvement, yeah, because you pass from two arc minutes to five seconds of arc. Yeah. Now comes Newton. Yeah, Newton. And uh, you will see, yeah, well, this is a very neat science, yeah. The way he estimated the angular diameter of the stars, yeah. So, well, first question, yeah. Are you all familiar, familiar with the magnitudes, apparent magnitudes? 
Yes or no? Yes? <laughs> okay, so I assume that you're familiar, yeah? So he said, well, probably the stars yeah, are just like the sun, but just think that the sun would be so far away that it would look like a star, yeah? So he just thought that the star could be so far away that it would look like a Vega, yeah? So we know, yeah, that in that case, you could write that the apparent magnitude, visible magnitude of the sun minus, yeah, the apparent magnitude of Vega is equal to minus 2.5 times the logarithm of the flux of the sun divided by the flux of Vega. You agree? Now, how much is the magnitude of Vega? Yeah, zero. Yeah, so this is zero. So this is good. The apparent magnitude of the sun, do you know? Minus 26.7, yeah? So it's huge, yeah? Minus 26.7, yeah? So Vega is a star of magnitude zero, and when it gets more negative, yeah, it means that it is brighter, yeah? Well, the moon, yeah, uh, may go down, well, may go up to minus 16, on five, something like that, yeah? Sirius, how much do you think? Sirius, the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Mi minus what? No, minus 1.6, something like that. Venus, Venus, you know, when uh, it is in quite richer, may get very bright with a magnitude down to minus 4.3, something like that, yeah? So th th this is a very bright object then, yeah? Jupiter may get also very bright. Yeah. But for the case of the sun, it's minus 26.7, yeah? So okay, minus 26.7 is equal to minus 2.5 times the logarithm. Okay, the flux of the sun, yeah? Now, do you agree that the flux of the sun, yeah? Measured on Earth, yeah? Well, is of course the luminosity of the sun divided by four pi times the distance from the sun to the earth, yeah? Square, yeah? This is the flux, no? Huh? You know, what would be the flux of Vega? Well, according to Newton, yeah? Well, it's just the luminosity of the sun, yeah? Divided by four pi, yeah? Times the distance between Vega and the earth, okay? So there are, well, nice simplifications, you see. 4 pi, luminosity goes away, so you don't even need luminosity. And uh, you find that this is equal to, oh, your square, huh? I forgot the square, yeah? So it is minus 5 times the logarithm, yeah, of the distance from Vega to the Earth, divided by the distance between the sun and the earth. Now what, uh, what uh, Newton did, yeah? He said, well, here I may multiply up and down, yeah, by the radius of the sun, radius of the sun, yeah? And here I find that this is equal to minus 5 times the logarithm of... Okay, now, the radius of the sun divided by the distance between Vega and Earth, yeah? What does it represent? So the radius of the Earth divided by the distance from Vega to the Earth. Would you agree that this represents the angular radius, yeah? Under which I see the sun at the distance of Vega. Yeah? So it's what I'm looking for, yeah? So I may say, oh, this is just the angular radius, yeah, uh, of the sun, or I could say of Vega, yeah? Because if the sun was at the position of Vega, yeah, it would be like Vega, yeah? So angular radius of Vega or ra angular radius of a star. And now, the radius of the sun divided by the distance between the sun and Earth 
What does it represent? Do you see what it is? Is a tangent under which I see the angular radius of the sun. But it's just so small that I may say, okay, this is just the radius of the sun. Yeah? Okay, now uh, here I have minus 26.7. Now the minus here I take plus here. And I find that I find that 26.7 divided by 5, yeah? Well, here I just take the exponentiation, is equal to the radius of the sun divided by the radius of vega, or I find that the radius of vega is equal to the angular radius of the sun, yeah? Times 10 to the power minus 26.7 divided by 5. Now, the angular radius of the sun, we know, yeah? It's uh, half, uh, well, 15 arc minutes, yeah? Or one quarter of a degree. Now, well, 26.7 divided by five, it's almost uh, minus five, yeah? So, so, the angular radius of a star, yeah? Is something like more, smaller than 100,000, yeah? the diameter of the sun. This is the answer, yeah? So now, when you make uh, the correct calculation, so you put here the angular radius of the sun, you find uh, two mini arc seconds, yeah? So Newton, yeah, already knew that probably the angular diameter of the stars that we see is of the order of two mini arc seconds, yeah? Fantastic, yeah? Without instruments, yeah? Without telescope, yeah? Just uh, a very nice thought. Okay, now, if you take yeah, the, <coughs> well, absolute, well, the upper magnitude of the sun, as we know it precisely today, the angular diameter, we would find that it is eight mini arc second. Yeah? So not far away. Yeah? It was a good uh, order estimate. And now, if you would ask me, yeah, well, how much is the Vega angular diameter today that we can measure with interferometers, yeah? it is about three mini arc second. Yeah? So it was very close to the right value. So, you see, we, we have passed here yeah, from two arc minutes to five seconds of arc, yeah? And now we are down to two milli arcs. Second, yeah. Okay, now, physo type interferometer. Or would you prefer to make a break now, or in, uh, that we start the experiment? Yeah, we make a, a small break. So your, your attention now, please, 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 please. Your attention will make later, yeah? So I just refer here, yeah, to the Young's double hole experiment, yeah? So what I have represented here, yeah, is a plane wave, yeah? Monochromatic, polarimetric, uh, also, uh, so it's uh, monochromatic, yeah? And uh, it's coming from a distant star, yeah? Therefore, it's a plane wave, yeah? Uh, then you see here a screen with two holes, little holes. There is an X axis to the top, a Z axis yeah, in that direction, and Y axis in your direction. Uh, now, at a given distance here, Z, yeah, I just set an observer screen. And uh, what I'm interested in yeah, is to well depict yeah, the light distribution of the monochromatic plane wave coming through the two holes. Yeah? So we know that the two holes, which are separated yeah, by distance b, which is a baseline, <coughs> so the coordinates of these two points are, you see, along x, b over r, b over 2, minus b over 2, and uh, y equals 0, z equals 0, yeah, at that location. And I know that whenever two wavelets yeah, will interfere positively, yeah, constructively, there will be a maximum of light. And I know that this will happen any time that the path difference between these two holes and a given point in the screen is equal to an integer number of wavelengths. Yeah? 
because they will be just oscillating in phase. And uh, for any odd number yeah, of half wavelengths, yeah, you'll get a minimum because of destructive interference. Yeah? So let's try to characterize satellite distribution. So what we are interested in here is to make the difference between the point P in the screen, observer screen, P, P, P1 yeah, is uh, the distance between uh, the given point P and uh, the whole P1. And here I just make minus module of P, P2. So let's assume that I yeah, is equal to one or two. So what I'm interested in is to derive the distance between the two point P and PY. Yeah, PY. So it's equal to square root yeah, of the difference between the x coordinates. So it would be x minus b half square plus y minus 0 square plus z minus 0 square, exact. Now, I, I should assume that the distance yeah, is so large yeah, that the distance between the two holes yeah, is very small in that I'm just looking uh, around the optical axis yeah, in the op observer's plane. So that the distance yeah, uh, between, well, module of x, module of y compared to z is very small. So here, what I, I do, I just set z in front of the square root, and I find that it's 1 plus x. Well, here I would just say xy, because it's point y. So 1 plus x minus xy square divided by z square plus y square divided by z square. Okay. Now I come back to PP1, PP1 minus PP2. So this will be equal to, you agree? I can set the Z yeah, here, just in front. So it will be square root. OK, now, as I said before, uh, continuing here, I shall still make an approximation. Yeah? I assume that these two quantities yeah, are very small with respect to one, as I said, yeah, x minus x1 is small with respect to z, and the same for y. So if you develop yeah, in series of Taylor, one plus u, do you remember how much it is to first order square root of one plus u? Yeah. So it will be the function yeah, for u equals zero, so one plus u, divided by 1 times the derivative yeah, of the square root, which will be 1 half over 1 plus u, 1 half for u equals 0. So this will be equal to 1 plus u divided by 2. So this, be, this can be rewritten as follows. z multiplied by 1 plus x minus xy square plus y square over 2 z square. Exactly. Yeah. Now I will just uh, replace xy yeah, by p1 and p2. So now for p1, it will be, uh, it will be what? Well, the square root disappears yeah, because I take the this development, it will be 1 plus x plus b1 half square divided by 2z square, then plus y square 2z square. Now minus pp2, so it will be minus pp2. Exactly the same, it will be 1 plus x minus b half square divided by 2z square plus y square divided by 2z square. I close the parentheses like that. 
equal to z multiplied by. So I see that nice simplifications. So the one and the one disappear. The y square and the y square disappear, which means that this distance yeah, will be dependent on y. Yeah, interesting. Why not? Now what will remain is the square of x minus the square of x. Then b over 2 square minus the b over 2 square. So it will be 0, 0. Then what will remain? Just the double product. So here it will be x times b over 2 times 2. So it will be x times b. Yeah. But here also I, I would get uh, the double product because it's minus minus the double product to be plus, yeah? plus still x times b. So here I may just write factor 2. And then I divide all of that by 2z squared, 2z squared. And I find that, well, nice simplification also, 2 and 2, and z and the square. So I find that this is equal to x times b divided by z. And now if I'd like to get the points where I have a positive interference, I just said that this should be equal to an integer number times a wavelength. So what comes out is that x over z is equal to n times lambda over b. Yeah. Now, it means that, well, I'm just looking here in the observer plane somewhere, for instance here. Yeah. So this is x value, yeah, you see here. This is the z distance. Yeah. So could you tell me what represents x over z? This? The tangent yeah, of this angle. This angle that I call phi. Yeah. And the tangent is so small that it is equal to the angle in radians. Yeah? So this I can also write as follows. I can say, OK, phi. So the angular distance yeah, between this point and that point, so this angle, yeah, is equal to an integer number times lambda over b. Now, for which value shall I get uh, like maximum? Do you agree? When n equals 0, yeah? n equals 0 means that x will be equal to 0, the angle 0, it's here. Yeah, it's the maximum. Now, when n equals 1, yeah? Well, I have the second maximum. Now, where well, the distance between uh, the two maxima is also the same as the distance between the two minima. So I could say, OK, the width, yeah? The central peak you see here, the angular width is equal to lambda over b. So this is the observer plane. So you have a maximum, then minima. Here are maxima, minima. And what I find is that, OK, the width, angular width, is seen from the center of the experiment, yeah? is seen from the screen, the middle of the screen. Yeah? So this angle, phi, is equal to lambda over b. And this is a kind of Ponsfeld function, okay? Because I had considered the plane wave, meaning that it comes from a point-like source, yeah, located at infinity. And so what, what I find is that well, the angular distance between uh, two minima, yeah, is inversely proportional to the baseline. So if you increase baseline, yeah, well, the central peak will get narrower, and narrower, yeah, and uh, the resolving power of your instrument yeah, will be better. So because you, you want to, to be able to see little, small details, yeah? Okay, so it means, yeah, second constatation, yeah, which is interesting, yeah, is that this relation is irrespective of y, yeah? Which means that, well, here, y equals zero, I have a maxima, but for y equal one, y equal two, y equal three, I should also have maxima, yeah? So, in fact, 
if I set here a screen perpendicular yeah, to that direction, what I would see is our fringes. I, I should see fringes, yeah? light fringes, yeah? with maxima, minima separated by lambda over b. Yeah. Okay, now this is what uh, is shown in this experiment. Yeah. So in a moment, yeah, we will make this second experiment. You will take a piece of aluminum and try to make two small holes half a millimeter circular separated by one millimeter. Yeah? It's a nice challenge. Yeah? If you succeed, yeah? so if you do something more or less like that, yeah? you should see, well, this is a point spread function yeah? of a one single aperture well crossed by fringes yeah? which are perpendicular yeah, to the direction between the two holes. So you see the, the two holes are located in that direction. These fringes are perpendicular. And we saw that the, we know that the min, well, the separation between uh, two minima is lambda over b. So if you make the, the b too large, well, the interfringe will get so small that maybe you will not be able to see it. Yeah? But it will be there. But, so don't make it too small. So one millimeter is a good number. And the size of the holes, half a millimeter. OK, now I come back before uh, making the experiment. Yeah? I come back here. Well, wh what Fizo had noticed yeah, is that uh, when uh, he was using such a screen with two holes, he had the impression that as he was getting closer to the light source, yeah, the visibility of the fringes yeah, was uh, disappearing. Yeah? So he would lose the fringes. Or if he would make the angular separation between the two holes too big, he would also lose the visibility of the fringes. Yeah? So is there, well, is there a good reason yeah, to understand uh, this intuitively? And uh, I would say yes. And I'm going to do it on that screen. So let's assume that I take a, a big converging lens, OK? Which means that, of course, well, the rays coming from a very distant star yeah, will get focused somewhere here yeah, in a single point. Now, let's assume that I take a, a big piece of cartoon covering the lens, like that. And now I make a small hole here, a small hole here, yeah? Do you agree that the light rays, yeah, which are falling here, well, they are falling on the lens, yeah? And they will get to here, the focal plane. What should I see here? What? Yeah. But shall I see the same iridis pattern? Because, well, don't forget, yeah? What? It will be? Yeah, much bigger. Yeah. So, so here, of course, it's all covered, yeah? So it's all covered. It's dark, yeah? It's dark. So you agree that, well, those light rays coming here will give rise, yeah, to an iridis. Well, it was just experiment you did before, yeah? With an angular size and given by 1.22, 1.22 lambda over d, where d is the diameter of uh, this hole, yeah? Okay, now let's assume that uh, I mask this hole, yeah? And oop, I make another hole here. What shall I see? What do you think I shall see? The same, exactly. Because well, the, the rays will just pass here, go on the lens, and will converge here. Yeah? Now, let's assume that I make two holes. Yeah? Two holes. So what shall I see? So well, classical expectation would be that you would see uh, one hairy disk over the other hairy disk. Yeah? But in addition, yeah, because of the Young's experiment, yeah, we know that we will see fringes 
perpendicular yeah, to the separation between the two holes. You see? Okay, so <clears throat> this is what uh, is shown here. Now, well, it came to the mind of uh, Stefan yeah, the following uh, scenario. He said, Let, let's assume now that you have two stars. Yeah? Now, if the two stars yeah, are too close, yeah, so the, the two stars are on top of each other, well, you cannot resolve them, yeah? so you only see one airy disk with the fringes. Yeah? Now, let's assume you have two stars yeah, with a big separation. Yeah? What you will see in the focal plane, do you agree? You will see two airy disks with the fringes, yeah, but separated by the angular separation between the two stars. Yeah? Now, if I put one on top of each other, the two stars are very close. You, you don't see that there are two stars. You see only one star. But now, let's assume that you have a small, small displacement, yeah, which is half the interfringe. Yeah, the value of half the interfringe. What will happen? What will happen if the two stars are equally bright is that the maxima of the second star will get into the minima of the first star, yeah? And the visibility will disappear, yeah? So, well, he said, wow, when will this happen? Well, it will just happen, you know, when the angular separation between the two stars is half, of, half the value of the interfringe, yeah? And he said, wow, this is a good experiment, yeah, to try to resolve stars in the sky, yeah, okay? So is it clear for everybody? It's, it's not complicated, yeah? So this is just intuitive. Okay, uh, now, well, one defines the visibility of the fringes as follows. You measure the intensity, the maximum of those fringes, and then the minimum, so it's I max and I min, and then you define uh, this uh, parameter V, I max minus I min, divided by I max plus I min, okay? And this gives you an idea of the visibility of the fringes. Indeed, if the star is single yeah, and you don't resolve it, well, you see here maximum I max, and here it's I min, but I min in that case is zero, yeah? like in the Young's experiment. So I max minus zero divided by I max plus zero is one. So when you don't resolve a star, the visibility of the fringes maximum is one. Now, Let's assume that you resolve the two stars, yeah? and one is uh, just a line like that, and the two stars are equally bright. Well, in this case, you could say I max is equal to I min. Yeah? So visibility is zero. You see, visibility is zero. So you don't see fringes. Very simple. Now, well, Stefan, oops, Stefan, uh, had the idea to put in front of the telescope of Marseille, which size was 80 centimeter, a big screen, yeah, with uh, not two holes, because well, through two holes, there is very little light passing, yeah. But uh, as I said, yeah, when you have two holes, yeah, you create fringes, yeah, along the y direction. So if you put more holes aligned on top of each other, it will always remain some fringes, yeah, okay. So to co collect more, more light, instead of uh, putting two holes, he put, you see, two slits separated by 65 centimeters. And then he looked at all the bright stars in the sky. And he had the hope yeah, that he would, uh, he, would resolve, <laughs> he would resolve the star. Yeah? Okay? And he did that for all the stars, and he did not find any visibility drop. Yeah? So all stars were un unresolved. Now, if you set, um, well, 65 centimeter for the diameter or the separation between the two slits, yeah, you find that the angular separation is smaller than 0 0.16 arc second. Yeah? So his deduction was that all stars have an angular diameter smaller than 0 0.16 arc second. Yeah? This was the first observational, let's say, big constraint. Now, do you remember I had a relation here between temperature and angular diameter for a given flux, yeah? If the angular separation of the stars are smaller than this value, what does it imply on the temperature? Yeah? Do you remember the, the relation? 
So it was something like, oops, I remember the temperature was equal to something in the power one fourth. Yeah? And then here we had one over the square of the angular radius of the star. Yeah? So if the ra angular radius is smaller than a given value, yeah, it means that the temperature is is smaller or larger? Oh. It's higher than the minimum value. Yeah, it's higher than the minimum value. So we knew already, well, nice information that all stars yeah, were hotter than a given temperature. Yeah? Well, I didn't make the calculation, but you could make it yeah, to find what was that value. Yeah? Okay? Interesting. Well, here I show a photograph yeah, of the Marseille telescope that you may still see today at Marseille's observatory. And uh, so the results were negative, but Michelson yeah, had the bright idea to repeat that experiment with two small telescopes, well, with one small telescope, yeah, 30 centimeter telescope of Lick Observatory. And he did the same experiment. Yeah? He put two slits on top of it, and he looked at the Jupiter's moons, yeah? so the Galilean satellites. And he knew yeah, that the Galilean satellites yeah, had an angular diameter of the order of one arc second or a bit even larger. Yeah? And he knew that with this 30 centimeter telescope, yeah, he should be able to observe that effect, the drop in the visibility of the fringes. And he observed it. Yeah? And uh, it's a real pity that Stefan yeah, didn't try to do that, to demonstrate yeah, the, well, the, the validity yeah, of this experiment. But more than that, Michelson and Pease, during the winter of 1920, yeah, they sat on top of, I think there is a better view here, on top of the Mount Wilson's 2.5 meter telescope, this is in Pasadena, in California, a very big beam measuring seven meters long, yeah? And, well, he had four mirrors, yeah? So one mirror inclined by 45 degrees, another one like that, well, another one like that, and, well, I hardly see, and this one was inclined like that, like that, uh, like that, and like that, yeah. And he could uh, move M1 and M4, he could separate, yeah, as he wanted, yeah? And so they started looking at stars, and he knew that Betelgeuse, yeah, which is a very bright uh, supergiant in the sky, in or Orion, yeah, uh, had a very big ang angular diameter because it was a red supergiant, yeah, and he resolved, he resolved the star. So he, show, he, he saw yeah, a drop in visibility for a given separation of the two M1 and M4 mirrors, and uh, the derived uh, angular diameter were, was 47 milli arc seconds. 47 milli arc second. Yeah. So, very nice. Then they could resolve five more stars, so six in total. Then they even had the idea to, to build a bigger beam, uh, which size was 15 meters. Yeah. And because of flexure, because of vibrations, because of a lot of problems, they could never use it. Yeah. They never resolve more separated or smaller angular diameter stars. Yeah. Okay, then, well, the difficulty of the method yeah, was uh, a concern because, uh, well, for the method to work, and we will see in the context of this course, yeah, that the difference between the light pass yeah, coming through the two mirrors and arriving at this point, yeah, the pass difference should be smaller than about two microns. So, if for any reason, yeah, uh, the length of the ray, yeah, <coughs> coming from the star, yeah, which is maybe, uh, I don't know, one case of a Betelgeuse, it's 650 light years, yeah. If the length, yeah, of that pass and the length of the other pass would differ by more than two millimeters, it's impossible to, to make the technique working, workable, yeah. So, it was a very big, uh, technological challenge yeah, to succeed. So the, this is the reason why when they put a 15 meters beam on top of it, yeah, it didn't work. 
everybody was aware of the very big difficulty uh, to operate interferometers in that way, and so, well, they abandoned the technique. Yeah? Then came another, another technique known as uh, uh, re well, stellar interferometry by Brown and Twist. Well, it's based uh, on a totally different approach, yeah? and uh, it was applied in the early 60s, but also to a very limited number of stars because the stars had to be blue, very bright. Then it was abandoned. Then radio interferometry, interferometry yeah, arose in the years 1950. And that was based yeah, on the technique of Michelson, yeah? interferometer of Michelson. And the reason why it worked at radio is that the wavelength is much longer yeah, than in the visible. And so the tolerance yeah, are much larger. So it's not a, just two microns accuracy, but it's a few centimeter accuracy yeah, at radio wavelengths. And this is the reason why it was so successful. And you probably heard about a very large array in uh, New Mexico, yeah, which was uh, one of the first uh, operated yeah, big interferometer at radio wavelengths. Yeah. OK. Well, Anderson, yeah, I just indicated here, yeah, Use a technique of a Michelson to resolve uh, spectroscopic binaries. So one knew from the spectra that there were two stars yeah, revolving around each other, and uh, he tried to resolve them angularly yeah, with a telescope. So he used uh, that beam, and uh, he could resolve many, many couples, spectroscopic couples. Yeah. We will make now the, the experiment with the two holes. So, oops, yeah, so this is the experiment, yeah. You try to make, yeah, two holes, oops. Two holes, yeah. Well, if possible, one half millimeter in diameter and separated by one or two millimeters. So. It's a nice challenge, huh? <laughs> but not such a big challenge as uh, the one of Michelson. Yeah. yeah. So we will continue now, uh, still a little bit, yeah. And uh, I will just speak now about uh, coherence of light, yeah. So as you know, yeah, well in the Young's experiment, we assume that the light was monochromatic until now, yeah? Well, if you assume that, yeah, you are not going to observe any star. Yeah, sure. Yes. Please. Please. Yeah. So you, you, you will all, all, always observe the star, yeah, in a very narrow bandwidth, yeah? Spectral band, yeah. So here I've shown, yeah, this, well, it's a wide dwarf spectrum. So the distribution of light as a function of wavelengths. And I've, I have assumed that we are observing the star at the wavelength lambda plus or minus delta lambda. This is the bandwidth, yeah. So, well, via the relation, yeah, lambda is equal to C over nu, you find that delta lambda is equal minus C over nu squared times delta nu. And so, delta nu here yeah, is equal to nu square, which is uh, c over lambda square. So it's a delta lambda over lambda square. Is it correct? Yeah, times c. Well, in principle, it should be okay. Yeah. Okay. And of course. Uh, <coughs> These two are of different sign, yeah, because uh, when you increase the frequency, you decrease the wavelength. So if we observe such a star, yeah, well, we have to collect all the wave trains at different monochromatic frequencies, yeah? So we have to, to make a kind of addition, yeah? And then when we have the expression for electric field, we, we may take the expression of the, oh, what's that? Okay. 
sorry. Is there some expression which are not showing up? Hello? Mm. Don't be afraid. Ah. No, something is not working. I don't know why. OK, but I'll do it here. So you agree that the intensity over the bandwidth delta nu is equal yeah, to, I would say, if nu prime, yeah, nu prime belongs to the interval nu minus delta nu, nu plus delta nu, I know that uh, the frequency nu prime, this expression will be a nu prime time exponentiation of this i to pi multiplied by nu t minus z over lambda, like that. And here I put a prime on this one, a lambda prime here. And now I have to integrate over the bandwidth, yes? Yeah? So from nu minus delta nu to nu plus delta nu. Now what I do, yeah, I, I should just insert here inside yeah, the follow, following term, exponentiation of minus i to pi multiplied by mu t minus z over lambda times its <coughs> complex conjugate. minus c over lambda. So you agree that when you multiply yeah, these two imaginary exponentials, yeah, you find that it's equal to 1. Yeah? I insert them inside. Getting warm here. <laughs> OK, so let me rewrite this as follows. I just say that, well, it's equal yeah, to the complex amplitude AZT multiplied by exponentiation of I to pi times nu T minus Z over lambda, like that, where AZT is equal to, of course, Do you agree with that? <coughs> so what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that when you are letting you know different uh, wave trains, different frequencies but within a small interval interfere with each other, yeah, it behaves still like a monochromatic wave, but with an amplitude that will be modulated. Yeah? And now well, it will be modulated. Uh, with a much lower frequency because the frequency of modulation or on the space scale yeah, I would say the wavelength of modulation yeah, is given by something like nu prime minus nu which is of the order of delta nu so this is a much yeah, narrower frequency range now I will demonstrate yeah, uh, for the case when uh, well here I, there is a prime here I forgot the prime when a nu prime is a constant. So I just assume that over the small spectral range, the continuum intensity of the star is a constant. Yeah? So I may take this away from the integration. Yeah? And I find then that is a AZT 
is equal to well, the A0 yeah, constant yeah, multiplied by now I, I should make some uh, variable changes yeah. so I know that um, lambda prime is equal to C over nu prime so nu prime is equal to C over lambda prime okay. uh, or still 1 over lambda prime 1 over lambda prime is equal to nu prime over C so here 1 over lambda prime you see I just write it is nu prime divided by C 1 over lambda is the same it's nu divided by C nu divided by C so I may rewrite this expression as follows it's equal to integration <coughs> from nu minus delta nu to nu plus delta nu of a, prime, a nu prime is a a0 goes outside the integration i to pi multiply now <coughs> I will just set nu prime minus nu in evidence it will be times nu prime minus nu multiplied by t minus z over c d nu prime yeah. now I will just make a change of variable yeah. I will just say that well u is equal to i to prime multiplied by u prime minus u times t minus z over c implying that du or d, d, d nu prime d nu prime is equal to so d nu prime is there will be equal to du divided by i to pi times t minus z over C. And so this integration will become integration from okay here it's nu minus delta nu so it will be from i to pi minus delta nu times t minus z over c up to i to pi delta nu times t minus z over c of what? Of the exponential of u. And this multiplied by d nu prime, which is du, divided by i times t pi times t minus z over c. Like this. Okay. I continue, this will be equal to A0. Yeah. This integration is easy, yeah, because the integration of the exponential is equal to the exponential. exponential. So it will be exponential of I to pi delta nu times T minus Z over C minus exponentiation of minus I to pi delta nu times t minus z over c close it and I divide it by I to pi times t minus z over c now do you agree that this would be cosine plus I sine minus cosine plus i side so it will be twice two sides it will be 2 a0 times the sine of 2 pi delta nu times t minus c over c 2 i goes away so here so will be only times pi t minus z over c and so I see yeah, what I was claiming before that the 
the result here, yeah, in terms, well, this is an intensity, in fact, yeah, it's an uh, amplitude, yeah, so the, here I wrote, uh, with, no, this is correct, uh, it's here, yeah, where the resulting, let's say, amplitude, yeah, of the electric field, yeah, will be uh, modulated, yeah, with a frequency which is not new anymore, but delta nu. Yeah? So much lower frequency. So now physically... Oh, I forgot the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, now you may decrease it. <laughs> forgot the microphone. Okay, now if you want to visualize yeah, this, well, I'm really sorry, yeah, something uh, is not working here. But what the diagram shows is the following. Let's assume that you combine yeah, many trains of light, so with the frequency nu prime yeah, in the small interval, yeah, nu minus, plus or minus delta nu. So, well, you may draw, yeah, many different trains with a very nearby frequencies, yeah? What results, yeah, at the end is something like that, yeah? So, if here I represent, I represent the amplitude as a function of time, is that there is a modulation of the amplitude Something like that. With the frequency delta nu, yeah? So the period, yeah? The period now uh, is equal one over delta nu, which is much longer. And here inside, you still have monochromatic light oscillating, yeah, with the frequency nu. Yeah, and this is known as a beat phenomenon, in fact. Yeah, it's a beat phenomenon. Okay? So if you combine yeah, many trains of waves with uh, nearby frequencies, what results yeah, is just yeah, a single train with a frequency nu, but being modulated in amplitude. Yeah? This is, if I just look yeah, along the time axis, what happens? Yeah? It means that I've frozen the z variable, yeah? So I'm in one location, and uh, I'm just recording the variation of the amplitude. Of course, intensity, yeah, it will be something similar, yeah? Now, <coughs> we could wonder, well, and now let's assume that we are freezing the time, so we are freezing the time, and we let the space variable, yeah, coming into play. So what I do here, this would be z, the time is being frozen. So the separation between two crests now here is lambda. And I could wonder, whoa, what is that wavelength? Yeah? Representing the modulation, yeah? Well, it's easy. Uh, we know that the lambda is equal to C over nu. So delta lambda is equal minus C over nu square time delta nu. Uh, now, delta nu, yeah, is, uh, delta nu, so I'm just thinking, well, maybe I could do it a different way. If I multiply yeah, C by delta nu, uh, no, C by the period yeah, that I showed before, which is equal C over delta nu. This would represent yeah, uh, the path traveled by the light yeah, during one period. And this would be one wavelength. So you could say, okay, this is equal to the effective wavelength, which is this one. Yeah? This is the effective wavelength, which is C times the period, but the period of the bit phenomenon and the period is one over delta nu. Now I just uh, take uh, those values, yeah? 
I have that lambda f will be equal to c over delta nu. So delta nu is equal to nu square times delta lambda over c. Okay. But now nu is equal to c over lambda. So this will be equal at the end at lambda square over delta lambda. Okay. And so I see that, wow, this is a lambda effective, yeah? It's much bigger than lambda, yeah? It's much bigger by a factor lambda over delta lambda. So narrower, yeah, is bandwidth, yeah? Where the longer, yeah, is this effective wavelength. And this is what you know as being the coherence length of light, coherence length, length of light, yeah? Rather than before, when we were freezing the space coordinate, and just representing things along the time axis, yeah? What I had represented is, as a period, yeah? Is a time of coherence, the time of coherence, yeah? So these are the two notions, yeah? So any question on that? No? Oh yeah, here as an example, yeah? Uh, this is, uh, these are observations of a mixture of light in this spectral range, yeah? So you see, you go from 207 to 233. The central wavelength, yeah, is 2.2. So the bandwidth, yeah, is of course 33 minus seven, which is 0.26, divided by two. So it's plus or minus 0.13, yeah? And here we see the bit phenomenon, yeah? So we see that, okay, it's still uh, light with a frequent or with a wavelength of 2.2 micron, yeah, but with a, a modulation of amplitude over a wavelength lambda effective, yeah, that we could calculate, yeah, and we could see whether it's correct, yeah. So here I have a lambda f, yeah, lambda f over lambda is equal to lambda over delta lambda, yeah, okay. Lambda is 2.2, 2.2. Delta lambda is 0.13. And I remember from last year that this division yeah, is about something between 16 and 17. Yeah? So, okay, 16, yeah. And now you, you can see here if it's correct, yeah? How many wavelengths lambda we have over lambda f? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, so this is correct. It works, yeah? So beat phenomenon works, yeah? Okay, now, I don't know. Okay. Now, I shall just uh, generalize yeah, the result of uh, the Young's experiment as follows. I consider that we have two holes here, so still the Young's experiment, but that the source, yeah, well, it could be extended eventually, yeah? And the light, quasi-monochromatic. So not perfectly monochromatic, but within a cert certain spectral band, you know, as I showed before, yeah? Now I'm wondering, what is the intensity of light at this point? Well, I just, okay, intensity is the time average, yeah, of uh, the complex amplitude conjugated by the complex amplitude, yeah? Now what is the uh, amplitude of light at this point? Well, I say, okay, it comes from two points, yeah? So it is the value of uh, the amplitude, yeah, at the point one, but at a time t minus t1q, where t1q is the time it takes for the light to go from the or number one to the observer at q, yeah? Plus the contribution from the second hole, well, which is, in fact, yeah, the intensity he had here, but corrected for the time it takes yeah, for the light to go from the hole two to the whole Q, uh, to the observer Q, okay? So I say, I say okay, uh, I have this expression. Now, what I, what I can do, yeah, I can add here plus T1, so I'm just changing um, the timing on my watch, yeah? But if I change here, I have to change it here. So here it will be minus, T2Q minus T1Q, and this is what I call two. Then I may rewrite, yeah, things like that. 
uh, the amplitude yeah, at this point yeah, is equal at the amplitude at that point plus the amplitude at the second point, but at the time corrected yeah, for the time difference between the two holes. Okay? Now, what I do, I take uh, this expression, I insert it here, there, inside. Yeah? And so I will get uh, V1 star plus V2 star, T minus 2, times V1 of T times V2 T minus 2. So I get for IQ that it is equal. Yeah? So I do uh, the distribution immediately. Yeah? I find that it will be V1 T times V1 of T plus V1 star of T times that one V2 T minus tau plus time average of okay now I have to to think it will be V1 star so it will be V V2 of T minus tau times V2 of T minus tau plus V2 T of minus tau multiplied by V1 of T. Correct or not? No? Here is a star, huh? yeah? And here, T. like that, huh? Yeah? Correct? Yes or no? Something is missing, yeah? This one, no? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, now do you agree that this is, uh, in fact, yeah, the intensity, yeah, you would receive from hole number one if it was alone, yeah? This would be intensity of the hole number two if it was alone. And now what remains, you see, is something like v, V1 of t times V2 t minus 2 times ta ta. Now do you remember uh, if I take two complex numbers, yeah? Z1 and Z2, Z1 times C conjugate 2 plus Z1 conjugate 1 times Z2 is equal to how much? Do you remember that? No? If not, yeah, we can demonstrate it again, yeah? So let's assume that zi is equal to a high plus i b high. Maybe, maybe not take i here with j. And this is a complex number, yeah? So here I will get that a1 plus i b1 multiplied by a2 minus i b2 plus a1 minus IB1 times A2 plus IB2. Now I distribute, yeah, and I find if A1, A2, now plus B1, B2, after plus I times A2 b1 and then minus i a1 b2 then I continue plus a1 a2 plus b1 b2 okay then minus i b1 minus i b1 a2 to b1 and after I have plus i B2, A1, yeah? So A1, B2. So I see that this cancel, and what remains yeah, is that it is equal to twice A1, A2 plus B1, B2. Now, if I look here, yeah? Uh, A1, A2 plus B1, B2, yeah? 
it is a real part yeah, of this product. Of this one or of the other one. Yeah? I see that the real part of this product yeah, is A1, A2 times B1, B2. Yeah? So whatsoever. So this is equal twice the real part yeah, of the product of Z1 times Z2 star conjugate complex yeah, or the other product around. Yeah? So here finally I find that uh, IQ is equal to I1 plus I2 plus twice the real part yeah, of the time average of V1 star times V2 times T minus tau. Now, in all interferometers, yeah, you may assume that two, the two holes are the same, yeah, okay? So let's, let's make that simplification, yeah? Otherwise, uh, it's not difficult to take into account the different size. But I can write that, okay, I1 is equal to I2 in that case, yeah? So I have IQ would be equal to two times I multiplied by one plus and now here I write gamma 1, 2 of tau, where gamma 1, 2 of tau is equal to the time average of V1 t times V2 t minus tau, like this, divided by I. And this is known as a complex degree of mutual coherence of light. Yeah? The complex degree of mutual co coherence of light. Well, in case you would not have any interference, yeah? no interference, this would disappear. Yeah? And uh, since, well, we, we have to take into account the interference, yeah? following the Huggins Fresnel principle, yeah? it's non negligible. So we have to take that into account. So here, uh, gamma 1, 2, yeah, is equal to the real part of this, yeah? Real part of that expression. Okay? Complex degree of mutual coherence. So we are here. 